please, just stop. It's your boy Danny back here in the flesh, letting you know that you're beautiful enough, you're strong enough, and you're good enough. And you're gonna stay that way because you're gonna eat meat and move weight. Now, saying that we aren't anatomically adapted for veganism is not the same thing as saying that we can't digest fiber or soluble fiber, that we can't extract glucose stored away in starches, or that none of the plant matter that we ingest is ever turned into short chain fatty acids by bacteria in our large intestine. These are facts, right? And these facts aren't in dispute. Now, the particular fact that we're gonna talk about today is intestine related, specifically the ratio of the length of our small intestine to the length of our trunks. Now it is a fact that the average value for humans falls somewhere between 10 and 12, but it's also a fact that a lot of herbivores and omnivores cluster around that ratio of 10 to 12, and carnivores more like five. It is not a fact, however, that this fact by itself somehow suggests that we're herbivores. The contention that it does suggest that is the founding vegan myth, and it's the myth that just won't die. Uh, now I suspect the reason that this myth won't die, even though I have seen bigger vegan YouTube accounts, huge vegan YouTube accounts, admit this kind of comparative anatomy is silly, has something to do with what's called Brandolini's Law. Now, you might have heard of it as the asymmetry of bullshit principle, which states that the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude larger than the amount necessary to produce it. Now this means that it's 10 times harder to prove someone wrong than it is to be wrong. Now there's a true story uh, relayed in this book called The Stone Age Diet that I like about a man who pulled like an into the wild escapade in like early 1900 Seattle. Stepped without the edible plant guide, uh, he brought along some hunting and camping gear and tried to live off the local fauna instead of the local flora. Now, this sounds way easier than the alternative, but neither of these prospects seem like exceptionally appealing to me. But this guy, just like the Into the Wild guy, ended up starving to death, of course. Um, so apparently it isn't just vegan that means bad hunter. Now, his remains were eventually stumbled upon by some construction workers who were building a new highway in the Seattle area, much like our friend from Into the Wild, with his story of slow starvation scribbled on some scraps of paper that he had. Um, and found on his body. They remained on his person. So they figured out who he was and what had happened. Now, I suspect this would be a very common fate for isolated hunters and isolated dudes with edible plant guides. The author making much hay of the exact same fact provides us with the interpretive matrix we need going forwards. He says, such an end is not surprising. It happens every day someplace in the world that man, stranded amid lush vegetation, should starve while plant-eating animals prosper, becoming both fatter and stronger. Gorillas. Volumes have been written on the extreme difficulties of survival under similar circumstances, and television shows have been made now, naked and afraid. I'm looking at you. Uh, when man is deprived of all food except that which is manifestly adequate for the grazing animals of the forests and plains. Now, from this philosophical starting point, a reasonable theory can be formed. There are two sorts of animals those that can subsist adequately on plant life alone, and those who cannot. We cannot. Why does this matter? We don't live in the wild. Correct. We developed agriculture. Also correct. But agriculture at scale, at meaningful scale, presupposes husbandry and not the reverse. That is, we didn't get to the point where we could eat animals because we started cultivating plants. That's backwards. We got to the point where we could cultivate plants at scale by eating and harnessing the power of animals. There are no plant-based foods in the wild. There are no wild wild rice patties. Um, Wikipedia says patties require a great deal of labor and materials to create and need large quantities of water for irrigation. Oxen and water buffalo adapted for life in the wetlands are important working animals used extensively in paddy field farming. So before civilization, there was cellulose and there were other animals. That's it. And as we said before, there were two sorts of animals, those that subsisted on plants alone and those that could not. Keep that in mind as we go along. Now, one more thing to keep in mind as we go along is that comparative anatomy is not nutrition science. Um, 
Comparative anatomy doesn't reveal the difference between essential and non-essential amino acids, essential and non-essential fatty acids, the cause of beriberi, the cause of kwashiorkor, the cause of scurvy, etc. Nutritional science does that. Let's say, however, that we don't heed this warning and we jump down the rabbit hole of comparative anatomy anyway. I want to humbly suggest that ultimately, similarity is in the eye of the beholder and not an inherent trait of the beheld. Uh, this is why genetically focused biologists construct very different phylogenetic trees or evolutionary trees than uh, biologists that aren't genetically focused. Um, it's also why dolphins are classified as ungulates, just like cows. What we choose to compare and the ways in which we choose to compare them can reveal more about our interpretive frameworks than the things themselves. That is to say, data is always and everywhere contaminated by theory, even mine. That's why we got to make sure our theories are on point. So despite knowing all this, you still want to do comparative anatomy. You still want to compare small intestines, do you? Okay, well, humans and lions both have small intestines that clock in at about 6.5 meters long. They also have large intestines that are about 1.5 meters on average. Um, bam, we're carnivores. End of story. No, objects the vegan. Not that way. You have to compare the ratio of the small intestine to trunk length. Why? Well, because comparing the ratios produces the desired result. Comparisons can be manipulated to create whatever outcome you like. Why not this one? Or this one? Okay, so you're still not persuaded. You still believe it's this one singular comparative anatomy fact that's relevant to settling the vegan carnivore debate. Herbivores have a big ratio, carnivores have a small ratio, we have a big ratio, therefore we're herbivores. What else could there be to discuss? Comparative anatomy, that's what. Uh, hourglass dolphins have a ratio of about 15 to one. Harbor seals clock in at 16. Sea lions, 18. Elephant seals for the win though at 25. Um, all of these are obligate carnivores. All of them have substantially larger ratios than human beings. How did these herbivore intestines get into these carnivores? So maybe you're watching this and you're in the cult and your brain is spinning right now and you're thinking about calling your dad but then a light bulb pops up over your emaciated vegan head and you say to yourself, holy shit, these animals all live in the ocean. Um, yeah, it must make them special in some way. Duh. The same way that harnessing fire, opposable thumbs, agriculture, science, language, technology, and culture make us special. How about the other way around? How about sloths? Who doesn't love three-toed sloths? Sloths clock in at two to one. That is like way lower than a lion even. It's half the ratio of a lion. Those are not herbivore intestines. Even more interesting is the case of the panda. They literally, and I mean literally, literally, not metaphorically literally, have carnivore guts. Okay, check out the link in the description down below about that. And surprisingly, the giant panda has a typical carnivorous gastrointestinal tract anatomically similar to a dog, a cat, or a raccoon with a very simple stomach, like humans, a degenerated cecum, like humans, and a very short colon, like humans. The gastrointestinal tract of pandas comes in at about four times the size of the body, just like other carnivores. So if pandas are proof that animals with carnivore guts can be herbivores, why can't humans just be proof that animals with allegedly herbivore guts can be carnivores? I'll tell you why. Because you're not interested in the evidence, you're interested in your cult. Strangely, it is often the very same vegans who could go on and on at great length about how sex is a spectrum that can't seem to acknowledge that digestive tracts might be equally spectrumy or complex. <laughs> this is because what people really crave, even more so than simple sugar, are simple narratives that make them feel superior to other people. They crave them so much that they will invent them ex post facto in spite of evidence to the contrary. What we've gone over so far should already have been enough to kill the founding myth of veganism. But now we are going to stand over the top of its lifeless corpse and beat it to a pulp. Most people having this debate are rightfully mostly concerned with the small intestine. Um, it is the powerhouse of digestion in human beings. But this isn't true for ruminants and hindgut fermenters, that is, actual herbivores. So all the brouhaha about the small intestine is in and of itself a tacit admission that we aren't herbivores. Sheep and cows cannot live without their stomachs. 
we can. In fact, you can dump huge chunks of meat directly into your small intestine uh, and nothing comes out the back end. This is because even without our stomachs pre-digesting our steak, uh, our coefficient of digestion in this post-gastrectomy state uh, still approaches 100%, like it tends to do when meat passes through the small intestine of a carnivore. Not so when we eat vegetables, my friend. They don't get digested by our own bodies enzymatically in our small intestines, like meat does. The large intestine is the place where actual plant matter, that's soluble and insoluble fiber, go. Uh, bacteria in the large intestine have to do the dirty work because that is where they live and thrive. The small intestine is mostly free of these bacterial colonies because it's essentially sterile. Now normally when bacteria thrive in massive colonies and decompose things, we have a word for that. Oh yeah, we call it rotting. But when bacteria decompose plant matter in your large intestine, we're very nice and euphemistic and we call it digestion. Now, I know you've seen corn come out the backside. That's because sometimes even the bacteria in the large intestine can't quite get the job done. They can't digest cellulose at all. Uh, what this means is that the veg made it through your entire, the length of your entire GI tract without being digested. How could this be, you ask yourself? Um, because it just isn't critical for human beings to be able to digest vegetables. Uh, this is also why, in addition to being able to live without our stomachs, human beings can also live without their large intestines. I want you to really think about this the next time some vegan tells you meat rots in your colon. Meat doesn't even make it to your f***ing colon, let alone rot there. Uh, because it doesn't really do much, and because people get appendectomies and survive, we call the appendix a vestigial organ. Uh, this long intestine of ours is also completely unnecessary for human survival. So is the human stomach. People live long, healthy lives despite having both gastrectomies and colectomies. Again, not the case for actual herbivores. They need their stomachs, their columns, and their cecums, and their appendixes to survive. This means that our ability to eat and digest plant foods is essentially vestigial. It's a holdover. Every piece of anatomy that we have that even remotely suggests that we're herbivores is completely unnecessary for human survival. Let me say that one more time. Every piece of anatomy that human beings have that even remotely suggests we're herbivores is totally unnecessary for human survival. Think about that. What does this fact about comparative anatomy that we've explored today, now that it's been placed in the proper context, say to you? Let me know down in the comments. Uh, what it says to me is that we're a type of special amylase producing facultative carnivore who retain a lingering vestigial ability to digest starch. This means we're carnivores. We're not obligate carnivores. Cool, I like baked loaded potatoes after a heavy squat day. We're an amazing species, godlike even in many ways. We have the ability to construct a healthy, properly supplemented vegan diet because of our big brains. Big brands that were generated and sustained predominantly by eating animal products. That's great news for vegans that are vegan for moral or ethical reasons. However, should you choose to perform this elaborate techno dietary ritual? Should you choose to yoke your displaced puritanical instincts to your consumptive urges and line the pockets of Silk, Dea, and Morningstar? You cannot justify your ritual or the construction of your dietary cult with comparative anatomy. Find another way or call your dad. Get out the cult. Thanks for watching. Catch you on the flip side.